to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703-036359-0808-5150-610. Email address lsmedia at livingseed.org or visit our website at www dot living seed dot org let us sit back and listen as the servant of god brings forth the word of life for us to progress in this clergy retreat the lord will not have us uh, take lightly the critical issues that the holy spirit had already set for us the obstacles for our sharpening, the instruments for our sharpening to become instruments, sharp instruments for great divine exploits. And as he was bringing the word of God, I felt that God is deliberate in wanting to show us mercy. Uh, there are two issues that have become quite paramount that we need to consider. And he put it as uh, obstacles and then instruments. And in my preparation this morning, I had been waiting on God to help us deal with what God must remove in order for us to be sharp. Actually, you know, bluntness has a process. Bluntness, lack of sharpness is because there is some layers and are layers of debts or layers of grease or some layers that have come to supercoat on the edge and actually what they do in sharpening essentially before they begin to actually use the other instrument of sharpening is to find the process of removing that coat, that layer, that impediment, or that obstacle. Am I right? So for example, when you when you want to sharpen a knife, there is a level in which you can just use ordinary file. And what the file essentially does is to remove the debts that have made the sharp edge blunt. But some other time, ordinary file cannot do it. So the blacksmith, what does he do now? He will put it back into fire. And the fire was simply to do one thing. First, it is to cause to melt that coat, that layer. And you know as it melts away, suddenly you will see again that the sharp edge is beginning to come out. Now, but even though the coat had been removed, it's possible that some of the teeth had been chopped. Now, so they need a different instrument. 
that's when they will begin to apply the hammer and all the other things that will be used. So I found that the process of sharpening, the first thing that every sharpener had to do is the painful remover of impurity that coats, that covers, that forms a layer on top of the instrument. When I was growing up, I used to go to the to the to the slaughter slab where we used to kill cows as a butcher. And we normally sharpen the knives very, very intensely before we face the cow. Now, if it is a cow that is not fatty, a cow that is lean, has not much fat, it's possible to use a knife or two knives to actually butcher a whole cow and you will only file one or two times. But if you are to butcher a cow that is full of fat, almost every 30, 30 minutes before you finish the butchering, you've got to either change your knife or you go back for filing. Now that one is more difficult to file because you know what happens? The, the, the fat will form an oily coat on top of the knife. Even when you bring another knife to sharpen it because iron sharpened iron. Now even when you bring another knife, that knife is not effective. Do you know why? Because instead of it helping to sharpen the knife you are wanting to use, it rubs oil on top of that one. So that one also becomes blunt. Even though we actually love to butcher very, very fat cows, those of us that are butchers, is the best meat. Because any part of it is solid. You can hold it even for a whole day. It doesn't reduce. Because something is solid in it. But that's very, very difficult for the knife. Because the knife gets blunt so easily because of the fat and the oil. So do you know what we do? Though we cannot be rushing very quickly to the blacksmith. So you just make a temporary fire. Just make a, a, a temporary fire. So while we are butchering the cow, there is a small fire. That fire was not meant to roast the meat. That fire was meant to help us melt the fat so that the sharp edge that had been coated can come out. Do you understand the picture I'm raising? So every time you present your life to God for sharpening, let us never deceive ourselves. The first thing that God tries to locate, what is the cause of your bluntness? What is the cause of his bluntness? Was it never sharp before? Or was it sharpened but because of coats or coatings either of fatty oil or of some other rough edges 
that have come to 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 make the sharp edge blunt and I would like to say it depends on the nature of the impurity the nature of the coating that's what determines the method of chapney the method of remover am I communicating with you now there are some time that you are using a, a cutlass and what makes it blunt is because as you are cutting the grass it went and gathered some soil on top of the face and the soil has become glued to it now do we need to put that in fire before we remove it no in fact sometimes you just need to wash it with water as you wash with water the the mud will fall out and then you can now bring your file to file it again but if the the coating that causes the bluntness is not of that nature it takes a different process to deal with it so this morning in continuation of the thoughts that God had used Dr. Yamsa to lead us into, we will now be going on gradually as we look into the word of God. Sources of bluntness and means of extraction. Sources of bluntness and what are the means of dealing with it as a process of sharpening I trust that the Holy Spirit will be guiding us throughout today that later on we will come back again onto that agenda because I believe that what God used uh, Dr. Yamsa to set this morning is an agenda for us and the Bible studies and the evening messages that God will be bringing to us, I sense that God is going to be taking us along this agenda. That's how God does his work. The Lord will help us. So the first challenge is to discover what are the sources, what is the cause of my bluntness. Sources of bluntness and means of extraction. Hallelujah. I would like us to take the word of God this morning and I would like us to, along with our theme passage that we've been introducing in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 10, we will now go quickly and look at the book of Isaiah. We will deal with the book of Isaiah in several chapters but we will go progressively as we see the Lord helping us hallelujah in Isaiah 48 Isaiah chapter 48 Isaiah 48 we would like to take verse 9, verse 10, and verse 11, Isaiah 48, 9, 10, 11. Then we will go to Isaiah 49, and we will read from verse 2, 
verse 3 and verse 4. Then we will go to Isaiah 50. Isaiah 50. And we will study a little from verse 4, verse 5, verse 6. When we have read those scriptures, we will then move into the New Testament and see the complement of these passages as it applies to our lives as New Testament believers. How does God deal with sources of our bluntness? What are his means of extraction? Isaiah 48 I read from verse 9 For my name's sake I will defy my anger and for my praise I will restrain it from you so that I do not cut you off Behold I have refined you but not as silver I have tested you in the furnace of affliction for my own sake and for my own sake I will do it. For how shall my name be profaned and I will not give my glory to another. Go quickly to chapter 49. 49. If I read from verse 1, it might be good. Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you peoples, from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother. He has made mention of my name. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me and he had made me a polished shaft in his quiver he has hidden me and he said to me you are my servant O Israel in whom I will be glorified hallelujah hallelujah now in chapter 50 in chapter 50 I want you to quickly look at verse 4 and I get it down to verse 7. The Lord God had given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He, he awakens my ear morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. The Lord has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. Nor did I turn away. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who purged, I mean, who plucked out the bed. I did not hide myself from shame and spitting. The Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint and I know that I will not be ashamed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, there are two points at which I wish to begin looking at sources of bluntness and what is God deciding? What is his means of dealing with it? And the first issue that I would like to lay very strongly before you this morning is that God is passionate about our sharpening. And it is for his own glory. Actually, your bluntness is not to his glory. Whatever 
blocks the channels of our lives from being sharp and from being able to release the glory of God. God does not like it. So let me first note that sharpening and God want to do it but it is not first and foremost for our own glory is for his glory. If we are sharp we are going to be sharp for his glory. Actually it is in that particular beginning that the first source of bluntness is to be located. Please listen carefully. I'm trying to be slow but God will help us as we press on. He said for my name's sake I defy my anger for my praise I will restrain it from you so that I do not cut you off. Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. For my own sake, for my own sake, I will do it. And for how should my name be profaned? And I will not give my glory to another. God is dealing with a matter that has made many of our lives blunt. And I would like to put it very carefully and here simply. And if we are going to be sharp, we've got to understand that quickly. Do you know the matter? Who takes the glory? The first issue that makes many of our lives blunt and we could not see a very sharp cutting edge anymore in our lives and ministry is because of the issue of who takes the glory. The issue of to whom does the glory go? To whom does the glory get to if our lives were sharp for exploits? And for some of us, God began to want to make your life sharp so that great things will happen effortlessly. But as we did not handle the issue of the glory, the desire for self-glory, the desire to make a name for ourselves. The desire to be prominent. The desire not only to be prominent, but to be preeminent. Brought our weapons at loggerhead with the rock of ages. Permit me to share with you very strongly this morning that one of the critical source why many of our lives and ministries cannot be sharp is that we have quietly tampered with the glory. We have quietly touched 
what we ought never to touch. The glory of God. And if God is going to make my life and your life sharp, that is one very, very critical source of bluntness that we must be ready to let go. That is something that the Holy Spirit must bring us face to face with in such a way that we will be able to settle that matter here. Because I'm sure, let me tell you, I'm sure that if God will make our life sharp like he did to the life of Peter, if God, and which God can do, he has done it before, he can still do it again. Can you imagine that Peter preached one message. When he, before he finished, he had not finished preaching. He was still talking. When the congregation stopped him. Do you know they are the one who stopped him? They said, tell us what shall we do to be saved. The congregation shouted, no, 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 no. It's all right, it's all right. We are ready to be saved now. And repent every one of you. And as if something went and hooked these people, they started filing out in thousands. Three thousands was, were, 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 were gloriously saved that day. And listen, it was not a three thousand that we normally count in crusade nowadays. These were three thousand that were hooked and the Bible said they stood in the apostles' doctrine. They came every day for Bible study. Sir, how wonderful will it be that you stood on the street of Port Harcourt and you gave a message and 3,000 souls in tears was stripping to God. Let me ask you, how many months will it take you to break down your church building and build another one? I'm asking, sir. Can I ask you if the instrument of ministry in our hands should be so sharp to the point that people like Barnabas, city treasurers, have repented. And they say, Pastor, my Lord Bishop, I don't know what I'm living for again. I want to throw my life for God. Then he went and sold his property in a choice area of town. And he brought the money in millions and dropped it at your feet. And said, Sir, this is the money. Whatever God tells you to do with it, be doing Will you still be like this? Will you still be will you still be reachable? What was the reason why many of us became blunt in life? The first source of bluntness is what I'm discovering in that passage. I will sharpen you, but for my glory. What first of all made our lives blunt is not because God has lost his power. It is not because the same scripture we are reading is different from what they read. 
It's not because they preached more differently than we are preaching. There was something that God cannot tamper with. And that's why I said, let this man not have the sharpness. Let him labor and sweat and sweat until he dies. I will not let him touch my glory because I can see that he is greedy for glory. I can see that the little thing we allowed him to see, he has already grabbed it. He is talking about himself. He is emphasizing himself, his achievement, his church, his denomination, his this one, his that one. And heaven say, hey, wait a bit. Wait a little more. If this man should have the kind of thing. Now, I'm just imagining how Peter <laughs> you need to read that scripture in Acts chapter 2 and see the kind of sharpness I'm talking about not only that the 3,000 stood every day they were in the church they did something more nobody counted anything that he has as his own so I imagine that those who have cars, those who had buses, they brought it, they said, church, this bus is now our bus. Anywhere you are going, just take it. Nobody lacked. And Peter was superintending over that work. Then one day he was passing. There was no preparation. He was just going to attend a prayer meeting. Somebody was there begging for arms. And Peter looked at him and said, Sorry, oh, silver and gold. I don't have. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And the man was looking at him and said, So, well, if you don't have uh, money, a big man like you, you mean you don't have uh, five naira. Peter said, well, I'm sorry, I don't have that. I don't have anything. But there's something I have. Now, listen, I, 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 I'm putting something across to you this morning that I want us to deal with if God will help us. If we will get on our knees in prayer, sincerely speaking, if me and you will come to a place where we can say to God, try us. We will not touch your glory. If we get to that place, I sense that maybe God might not lavish everything, but he may say, okay, let me give you a foretaste and see how you will behave. I was looking at this man who effortlessly, effortlessly just look at the man and say, well, we don't have money. But what we have, we give to you. And he said, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, stand up and walk. The man was still looking at Peter and John. He said, what are you talking about? If I could stand up and walk, will I be begging here? I'm telling you that you give me money so that I can get something to eat. He has said, stand up and walk. What does that mean? So Peter, wanting to help the man, he stretched forth his right hand and held him. And that's how the man stood up. Now listen. And as the man stood up, he was jumping, he disturbed the prime meeting. I hope you know that the prime meeting ended abruptly. Because the man came up, he said, well, please, 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 please. Ah, 
You say, who is that? They say, ah, that's the man that was begging. Say, yes, I used to be the beggar, but and he's jumping and dancing and giving glory to God, and everybody was rejoicing. Then he went and heard Peter. I said, this is the man, this is the man. And Peter said, why are you looking at us? Why are you looking at us? I said, by our power, by our holiness, have we made this man stand before you? Why do you look at us? It's not about us. It's that same Jesus. And at that point, 5,000 again, started crying. What shall we do to be saved? What shall we do? Now, in a matter of about two weeks, a church of 120 became 8,120. And this is not Sunday, Sunday worshippers. They came on Wednesday, they came on Friday, they came on Monday. Then they broke bread from house to house. Holy communion couldn't be done in one center, so they were doing it from house to house. The money was flowing. Because everybody that sold them, they were bringing it. Money was everywhere. There was no need for launching for a project. Money was there. The heart of the people have been so moved that they were selling what they had. And for you to know, one man brought some huge money and, and Peter stood and said, excuse me brother Ananias, tell me is this how much you sold it? The man said, ah, yes, yes sir. Peter said, eh? who forced you to go and sell your land? When it was in your hand, why was it not yours? When you sold it, was it not yours? Why did you decide to tell lie now against the, to the Holy Spirit? And you kept something back. The man said, yeah. He gave up the ghost. No police was called. Because it's not a matter of police. Do you understand that now? I'm, you know, I'm just looking at ordinary brothers like ourselves that God linked sharpness in ministry. What is it that those men overcame that kept them sharp? The matter of the glory. So for my glory, I will share with not any man. When it comes to glory, and yet you will not know that if there is anything that human nature is greedy for, what was that? It's glory. If there is anything that makes us self-defensive, if there is anything that makes us to want to make a name, if there is anything that makes us to continue to struggle for hierarchies and promotion, what do you know it is? It is that quiet desire. For what? For glory. And it will not be simple to brush and say we will be sharp if the Holy Ghost will not put his finger to deal with that primary sin, the primary source of our bluntness. I am asking God, why is it that you are so slow in releasing your power to our generation. When it is nothing with God to save with many or with few. Do you know that it is nothing with God 
to, to deliver. Do you know that if God wants to overrun our land, very easily he can do so. Do you know, sir, that the message that you will preach and you will see wonderful things happen in your congregation and denomination is still not going to be anything so big or bogus. It will only be that heaven decided to back it up. But there is a matter that God is settling here. And I perceive there lies our bluntness. There lies the sluggishness with which our ministry is moving. You may not want us to attack that issue. You may want us to talk about methods. You may want us to talk about uh, more education. All of that is good. But it's like living leprosy and chasing ringworm. I don't know how many years ringworm could be on your head. It cannot do you anything. Ringworm doesn't kill anybody. The only thing ringworm will do is that it will chop some of your hair. That's all. It will be scratching you and as you are scratching it, the thing will be happy. That's all. But if you have a little spot of leprosy, every blessed month, the thing is progressing. And it will chop all your hands, all your leg, everything until you are finished. How could somebody have bright patches of leprosy and neglect it and begin to spend time traveling everywhere? When he meets a doctor, he says, Doctor, uh, this is not my problem. I know they say it's leprosy, but I don't have problem with that. It is this ringworm that is a uh, Chop it, you know, scratch me here. Please help me. Sometimes we focus on what is not important. I am sensing that if this situation, I mean, this matter is resolved, if God is convinced that that issue of desire for glory is dealt with in our hearts. I sense that we will experience some level of sharpness. We will see something because I can I'm imagining how some of you precipitous, some of you archdeacons standing up just to give a message and God we just decide to do something glorious. And people will look later and say, when has this thing happened to our precipitor? What has brought this to this, our vicar? When did it become like this? Because it will be beyond explanation. But there and then, the question is, who oh, takes the glory. Now, so, we take a little illustration because that's a major source. If it's dealt with today, if we come to the cross and the Lord Jesus extracts from our life and I would like to analyze, if I can, those indices that shows that you love the glory. Because some of you say, no, 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 I don't want the glory, I don't want the glory. But even in saying that, I can see that the second side of your mouth, he say, I want the glory, I want the glory.
Imagine that the disciples, they were with Jesus. And they were talking among themselves. And you know the question among them? Who is the greatest? They were talking on, on that tone. Who is the greatest? If it's not here, who is, who is in charge? Who is in charge? <laughs> Jesus did as if he didn't hear. So as to let them talk what they are talking. So when they got to the house, he said, you guys, what were you discussing on the road? What were you saying? Were you talking about who is the greatest? Then he decided to demonstrate something to them. You would think they have learned their lesson. Then the mother of James and John came and said, Lord, I want you to do for me whatever I ask. The master said, what do you want? He said, excuse me, I want that this is my son, John, and this one, James, who sit one at your left, the other one at your right. Now let me ask you, did you think it's only John and James that are looking for glory? <laughs> eh? How did we know? The Bible said when the other ten had, <laughs> what, what happened to them? They were angry. They were angry. Now, if you don't want the glory, why are you angry when it is given to someone else? If you are not interested in the glory, why does he bother you? Who takes it? If it is not that there is something in you that is clinging for something, even though you don't have opportunity yet, why is it a matter? Why is it a matter of how I'm addressed? And heaven is looking and saying, mm, give this man a sharp utterance that tears the heart of men, that wake the dead. Hey, he will go with the glory. Make him blunt. Let him work so hard with little or nothing so that he gets nothing to boast. Hallelujah. So the first issue that we must pray about, if not that we are going for breakfast, when Dr. Yamsat finished, I just thought we should just fall down before God. When he began to ask, he said, you, you, you are the greatest obstacle, you are the greatest coating, you are the source of your bluntness. I thought that the Holy Spirit has removed the cloth, you know, from the masquerade. And he said, this is the issue. Let's deal with it. And I felt that even if this morning, what the Holy Spirit gives me opportunity to do is to re-highlight that matter. The source, the principal source of our bluntness. Now, take note of something before we take an illustration and look at our scriptures that we are looking at. In 2 Corinthians, or no, 1 Corinthians, please, I want you to see 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Now, in verse 26, down to verse 29. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. 
and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing things that are. Just for one reason. What is that reason, please? So that no flesh should glory in his presence. Now, I don't know how to put that passage. I don't know. I am under... Um, there's something pressing in my spirit that that's where the point is. That's the issue. That's the matter that I wish heaven will deal with for me and for you this morning. And please take note that as, I'm, as I knelt down as a, a Baba began to ask us to pray and he said, get on your knees and present yourself to God and say, God, why? Why are you looking at me like this and you will not make me sharp? Why are you slow in releasing your power? As I was getting on my knees and said, Lord, that question was confronting me. The hand of the Lord is not short, I cannot say. Suddenly I know. I just know very deeply in my heart that there is no problem with God's power. I just sense that what God must put into the furnace to melt out of our lives once it is taken out of the way. Once the obstacle is taken out of the way, there is nothing that God cannot do with a life that has been broken from the desire for glory. Now, look at Corinthians very neatly, very quickly. And this is an issue I don't know how to put, but I'll just put it to you because I know that God has helped several of us to to understand biblical things so I will not spend too much time on that. He says, you see your calling. Brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh. Can I remind some of you that you were sharper in ministry where you did not acquire this present wisdom that you have. You are not with me again. Do you know when you were helpless, when you did not know much, you saw Spontaneous results. Are you hearing me? But as soon as you began to see results, and people cannot identify your status, your education, your presentation. With what is happening, something whispers to you. You've got to present yourself properly now. You've got to get more wisdom now. You've got to get more organized now. And you know what God saw? The flesh wanting to touch the glory. Did you know it was the glory of God that when the Sir Henry Council sat, it was the glory of God. Listen. They said that a notable miracle has been done by the hand of these fellows. We cannot doubt. 
and that these are unlearned barbarians. We don't, we cannot die because even now, as they are standing, they are barbarians. So, where is the secret? That a notable miracle has been done by the hand of these fellows, we cannot doubt. And that these are unlearned barbarians. We don't, we cannot doubt because even now, as they are standing, they are barbarians. So, where is the secret? Are you getting me now? And they could find nowhere else. They said, it could only be that they are being with Jesus. It could only be that this didn't come from them. It came from God. That was what, hallelujah, kept them sharp. not many wise according to this word, to the flesh were called. Not many mighty, not many noble are called. I am happy with the Bible because he didn't say not any. If he had used the word not any, it will mean that there will have been no space for any noble to be involved in the work of God. But that's not true. You only say not many. It means there will be some. But for some, for those ones to be able to be used of God, something has happened to them. They had emptied themselves of what they could have been boasting about. And they have become an ordinary people that God can freely use. But you don't get many of such. He said, have you not noticed that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise? God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing things that are in order that did you see that in verse 29. Did you see verse 29? Eh? In order that no flesh brother listen do you know that the reason why me and you are appearing blunt is that God is not convinced that our flesh will not do what? Will not glory in his presence. And we need to discuss it at this level so that we don't stop what God wants to do. Sometimes it's painful that God will leave you as bishop. And when he wants to do something serious, you go and use somebody that didn't go to school. And when God is walking through that person and people are running there and say, ah, you say, well, what did he know? It's not the question of what he knows. 
It's a question of who is walking through that life. That's the matter. So, how can we deal with this source of bluntness? Have I painted enough a picture for this morning? Have you seen the matter? Can I ask a very simple question? Can you identify with the matter? Can you identify with it? Can you sincerely pray about it? Can you sincerely say, oh God, who actually takes the glory? We've been singing some hymns for the past 300 years. All our churches are singing those hymns. All our denominations. It has been translated into many, many, many of our local languages. Some of those hymns. Have you ever found out those who wrote those hymns that have blessed millions and millions of people? Do you know what I discovered with several of them? Many of them preferred to be nameless. If God were to give you, Madam, God gave you a, a good song. Will you teach the choir? Or what will you first do to tell your husband? Let's launch this album. If any of the guests stood up and is singing your song, something is rolling inside of you. She has, she's singing my song. That's my song. So God, God looked and said, ah. what if we made this woman's song to become the anthem for the body of Christ? What will she have become? She will have become a thing God, isn't it? So God said, block her. Block her channel. Stop it. No flesh must glory in my presence. Do you remember the children of Israel under Gideon? Do you remember them? Do you remember the 32,000 that Brother Gideon gathered to go and fight for God? Do you remember? Do you remember the question? That was the matter, and they had to discuss it before they can go. Tom, look at Judges, I think. Is it Judges 7? Are you there? Judges 7. And the Jerubal, that is called Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Harod. So that the camp of the Midianite was on the north side of the of them by the hill of Moreh in the valley. Verse 2. The Lord said to Gideon, please look at this thing now. The people who are with you are what? Are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Now, let's understand that scripture quickly. Let's understand it. Wherever you have read the word of God, in fact, from, the, from chapter 2 of, of, um, of that judges, whenever they went to battle, there is always a recurrent phrase. The Lord delivered 
into the hand of Othniel. Eh? And the Lord delivered the king of Mesopotamia into the hand of Ehud. So I discover that wherever you read about victory, are we together? What happened? It was God that did what? That delivered. So can you imagine what we are talking about? What happens is that when God is ready to walk, he delivers this man, no matter how powerful he is, he captures him and delivers him to the hand of this man. So, people will be thinking that it is Dr. Ango that captured. Mm -mm. Who did? It was God that delivered to his hand. Do you know that every time there's any sincere spiritual ministry, it's not about you. It's God who is delivering things into our hand. Are you getting me? Now, so when Gideon gathered people, God said, hey, these people, there are too many for me to deliver the Midianites into their hands. You are not with me yet. Are you getting me? Do you know that when David went and faced Goliath, the discussion is not that I will kill you. What did he say? He said, the Lord will deliver you into our hands. Do you know, that's the secret of any sincere ministry. Ministry is not giri, 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 giri. It's if God will deliver something, Baba, in your diocese, it's not about giri, giri, giri. It's if God will deliver the land to your hand. If God has not delivered them to your hand, you will do like this, you will sweat. All your big, big, big English and theology will not work. It won't. It's not that they are not good. They are all right. But God is not ready to deliver the land to your hand. So, if God will take this man now and hand him over to you, he said, I've given him over. That's all. As big as he is, he will be in your hand. Are you hearing me, sir? That's what God does. Now, thank you, sir. He now says, so when David said, the Lord will deliver you to our hand and we will give your body to the beds of the air. That was the secret of battle. It's not a matter of, I am taller, I am shorter, your experience, I'm not, that's not it. It's God. So now I'm hearing God said, these people that you have brought, there are too many for me to deliver the Midianites into their hands. Why? Why? Please check it. Check it. All of you check it. He said, lest Israel claim what? They claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. That's the issue. Who takes the glory? If God helps me and you this morning, and we settle this issue, not in passing, sincerely. Cooking is big. Am I right, sir? But it's not a bigness. It's about God delivering it into your hand. I say, my servant, I have handed this to you. That's all. That's all. So the Bible said, lest they will claim the glory. Old King James said, they will do what? They will vaunt themselves against me. 
saying, my own hand has delivered me. So what did God decide to do? He said, please tell the Midianites that you are not ready yet. Let's sort out who takes the glory. I don't know whether you understand that this meeting, one of the reasons why you have been blunt for years is the question. Some of you, you don't shout it. What was af making me afraid in this passage is that they have not yet done it. Did you notice that God, they have not done it. But God saw their future. God saw their heart. God knew what they would do. God said, hey, they will do that. Blunt, block them, block them. So he brought them down. The first announcement disqualified how many? 22,000. Now, even though, listen, this is where I want you to go now. Even though the question they asked that reduced 22,000 was not, who will take the glory from God if God should deliver the Midianites to our hands? Who among you will like to claim the glory? Let me see your hand up. Was that the question they asked? If they asked that question, will anybody raise his hand? I want to tell you. Your desire for glory may not manifest in the direct it may manifest indirectly. And you know what God did? Tell them, is any one of you afraid? One of you have married some of you have planted vineyard and you are afraid that if you follow God to this battle he will rob you of your vineyard go home how will you link that to the desire for glory that's the secret some of you don't know that it is glory you are looking for that is manifesting in your fear of failure. Some of you, you hate failure like anything. Say, mm, no, I don't want anybody to rubbish me. Who are you not to be rubbish? Isn't it a desire for glory? The fear that you are expressing, is it not a quiet desire for glory? You are a perfectionist. Who is a perfectionist? A perfectionist is someone who, who glories that nobody can discover his mistake. When Baba was talking in the morning, he said we all know our weakness. But we get offended when anybody says, Sir, I see your weakness. Why are you offended? It's a desire for glory. Because you think that if people should discover an area of your life that is not so correct, they will use that to pull you down and you will not be on top again. So you do everything to hide your weakness. You do everything to write letters of self-defense. And God said this man, he loves the glory. Blunt. Please block his sharp. Because if we give him success, nobody will sleep. Do you know how some of you by God's grace? Listen to me, by God's grace, when you are just a curate or when you first got out of the seminary in the zeal of your lack of experience you went out 
and God by your hand caused you to plant 20 churches. Are you hearing me? Do you now know one of the things you are using to now press for recognition and for promotion? They say, hey, well, they are, they, are, they are nominating that man. Let him show us what has he done. Let him submit his CV. Let us see. So you quickly prepare your CV. Uh, by the grace of God, in the year 2001, uh, from a little church of 50 members, we planted five churches that are standing. I say standing churches. And by the grace of God, I set up an evangelical team. I mobilized them. I equipped them. I trained them. I sponsored them. And by the grace of God, we planted another five standing churches. So actually in three years, between 2001 2004, we have planted ten vibrant churches. So what is becoming the archdeaconry? Actually, 70% of the churches that they are counting under that archdeaconry were my churches. But where I'm not seeking anybody's promotion, I only want you to know that some people that you are making venerable, they are, there's nothing venerable about them. Praise the Lord. You know what God says immediately? He said, look at that man. Block his instrument. His progress. Friend, what is the matter that is making God to look at you and you are growing old and you are not seeing serious results in your life and ministry? Quiet desire for glory. But that desire for glory sometimes is never manifested by outspokenness. It's manifested by fear. I will lose. I will lose. I will lose my name. I will lose my entitlement. I will lose my position. I will do this. I will. No, no. So God said, those of you that are afraid, afraid of whatever, go back. Surprisingly, 22,000 said who, who wants to waste his life for nothing I'm going they went back God saw their desire for glory but manifesting in their fear of failure their fear of loss I can see some of you very sitting tight self protective because you are afraid that something will be lost. You need that thing for your glory. Some of you, I'm afraid to inform you, God has already blocked some of you. There are some of you that are pastor here, but you are doing secret ministry somewhere. You are reserving something. You are not serving the denomination full-heartedly. You are saying, this is my ministry, my ministry. You are reserving something. You are not ready to lose out. And everyone say, hmm. Beg him. If we show him glory now, he will grab it. Ten thousand remained. I know that brother Gideon must have been confused. They say, hey, 
God, 22,000 are going. When he presented the other 10, God said, even this 10, they are still too much. What is still the question? Who takes the glory? Some of you, your desire for glory is not manifesting in terms of fear. Some of you are brave. Brave. Strong will. And as far as you are concerned, let's put our head. Let's see where the matter will be. Quiet boasting. And the Bible looked. They are too much. Now bring them down, please. I will test them for you. He brought them down to the brook. And God was looking who will take the glory. Can I tell you how he tested them out now? He brought, you won't know that God is testing who takes the glory. You won't know. I'm, I'm asking God, I say, Lord, you know human heart so much. I don't know myself. I don't know what God sees. And heaven is saying, don't yet confirm Brother Gwile too much. If we bring more bishops, and I want you to know that if God stop being afraid that we will touch his glory, you can't predict where the clergy retreat will go. Are you understanding? If God knows that we are not going to vaunt ourselves against him, if God knows that no matter how he brings his church, we will sit down together, we will humble ourselves, we will sharpen one another and we will give glory to God. You can't predict. You may be dragging people from America, from uh, Australia, from everywhere and say, go there. And all of us, we will be living witness and say, ah, what is God doing? There's nothing God cannot do. But a question has to be settled. Who takes the glory? How did he want to test the next set of people in knowing whether they would take the glory? He just brought them to where there is water. Are you hearing me? He just brought them to where there is a little provision of water. Imagine they have been traveling and there is no water. And then they saw water. So God is saying, just wait. You will see now. You will see something in them that I saw that you didn't see. As he brought them to the water, he will say, wow. Who knows when we will ever get this kind of water again. So what did they do? They put everything on the ground and they began to drink with, they, they buried their head. They put their two hands. They are gathering. They are gathering. Hey! Pastor, do you know that some of you, as soon as you were transferred to that place, the first thing you were gathering is for your retirement house. You, you quickly whisper to yourself, who knows when they will transfer me from this place? Opportunity comes but once. <laughs> Man of God. Opportunity comes only but once. So you began to say to yourself. All the important personalities in the in the in the in the in the parish. You started connecting quickly. Heaven is saying, mm, if we bring this man into a greater glory, he will grab it. By the time God sorted this man out. 
300. Only 300. 300 that saw water and are not conquered by it. 300 that saw provision and they disdained it. 300 that saw glory, glorious provision and they just laughed like a dog. And he said, let's go, let's go, let's go. It's not time to drink anything now. It's not time to make ourselves comfortable now. This is not the time to build any house now. This is not the time to change our car now. Oh, no, 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 let's move, let's move, let's move, let's move, let's move. Only 300. Out of 32,000. Is that a good percentage? Actually, if it was 10%, it would have been 3,200. So 300 was something like less than 1%. Less than 1% will not touch the glory. That's why usable vessels are scars. That's why authentic ministries are scars. That's why God has not been able to deliver, deliver, deliver great things into our hands. That's why your weapons is appearing blunt. Would you like us to pray about that this morning? There is going to be a small space to be alone with God. This alone with God is not is to ask authentic question. God, try me. Show me who I am. This is not a meeting where we are comparing notes with people. This is a place where we are saying, God, why am I blunt? Why can't I see miracles in my life? Lord, why is it that I am not seeing the kind of results that men of old saw despite my effort? Is there a quiet desire somewhere in me that is looking for self-affirmation, self-actualization? Am I seeing the position of bishop, the position of uh, uh, the chairman of DCC as something that affirms me? Am I more concerned about the, the appearance than the labor that I'm supposed to execute? Am I more interested about the greeting? I hope you know that greeting can be something. Eh? I hope you know that greeting is something. And somewhere in your spirit, you love the greetings. Can you go before God this morning and say, now, oh Lord, here am I. Try me. But how will God deal with that source of our bluntness? I notice he said, I've refined you in the furnace. Not as silver. I've refined you in the furnace of affliction. I need to cut off your desire for glory. That's why I've, I've not been able to use you. I am looking for people that are ordinary so that I can shame those who are mighty. I'm looking for those who are weak so that I can bring to nothing those who think they are strong. I'm looking for those who appear foolish so that I can discredit those who think they are wise in this world. Can I bring you to the place where men will regard you as foolish and you will be happy? Can I make you weak so that I can freely release my grace unto you so that there will be nothing to glory about. 
it will be so apparent that this thing that God is doing is not about you, it's about God. Do you want that? Do you want that? Sources of bluntness. You will have thought, as you say, the greatest source is sin, the sin of fornication, that and that. I would like to tell you, all of those sins, are you hearing me? They emanated from the desire for self-actualization, for glory. That's what brings it all about. Do you know that if you are a fornicator, the reason why you kept doing so is that you are so concerned about your glory that you will never confess it to anybody. If not that sin makes a man to look for glory, sin will have been the easiest thing to deal with. Because if you sin and you could come up and say, you call me Lord Bishop, but I'm really in trouble. Don't honor me as you are honoring me again. I'm not as honorable. Sin has perforated my life. Do you know that God will be happy to identify with your life, to change your situation, to bring you out of that, and to use you? <laughs> Man of God. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. How come? So you do everything both face self defense to hide it because you want glory. Anywhere people cover sin, do you not know why we cover sin? Excuse me, why do we cover sin? We don't want to be shamed, we want the glory. If somebody should report and say hey, something, say, hey, you want to spoil my name, spoil my name, all the cases of blackmail in court. Is a desire for glory. Jesus was revived and he revived not. It didn't matter to him what you called him. What mattered is what does God say about him? I beg you this morning we can't go further with sharpening without extracting the source of our bluntness. Wives, go to God and check. Husbands, why is it so difficult to say sorry to your wife? Eh? Is that the outcome? I'm your husband. Even if I do something wrong, Is that how to talk to somebody's husband? So the, your family is boiling in the bedroom. But you are well dressed to minister. Heaven said, look at that man. Peg him. Don't let him see anything. He will put more strength. But let's show him no success. May the Lord help us. May the Holy Spirit reveal to you deliberately where is that thing? Can we get to pray this morning and say, Father, deal with this matter for me. Let's pray together. If we're sharp, it will be for his glory. And if we are sharpened, it's not about you. It's not about your success. It's about his glory. God can show us great success if he knows that it will be for his glory. God can use some of you to turn your denomination around in the next two, three years, if he knows that you will not tamper with the glory. The questions I want you to deal with 
there are questions that only the Holy Ghost can help you to deal with. Please pray. Please ask God. Help my life this morning. If you are casual about it, you may not see it. But if you go on your knees deliberately and say, now Lord, between me and you, why will you not make my life sharp? Why will you, oh God, be watching me to be struggling? Lord, here am I. Extract that desire from me and sharpen me for your use. Sharpen me, Lord. Sharpen me, Lord. me, O oh God, Yerama. Lord, Yerama. Who takes the glory? Who takes the glory? God can give you the whole of Lagos. And in a short while, people will say, see what the Lord has done. But who takes the glory? This may be the reason why he has allowed your, 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 your implement to be blocked. Only God can handle what I'm asking him to handle. Lord, thine is the glory. Thine is the power, the kingdom and the glory. Forever and ever and ever. Not for two years, not for three years. Some of us will give God glory at the beginning. But I'll tell you why we take over. Lord, deal with me. Deal with me. I say, please, it's you this morning, Lord. Please deal with me. Deal with my life. Some of you will remember that it was that water where you sat down and you started laughing. You started drinking, drinking. And God said, let's not give this man more miracles. Let's not give this lady more results. Let's wait to see what she can achieve with her strength. As we call on God this moment. Lord, please have mercy on us.
extract extract this this work this desire of the natural man from my life oh God Lord don't let me go away from here strip it off me strip it off Lord that I may be able to say thine is the kingdom thine is the power and yours is the glory only that do you know our past and our present you also know even the future that we don't even see we want you Lord to extract this source of bluntness it's the main issue that has made you to hold on from making our lives so sharp as to bring about great results. Father, this afternoon or this morning, as we go on in our time together, in our studies, in our praying, don't hide anything from us. All the revivers that you gave stopped when men touched the glory. Moses was so effective. Was so effective. Was an effective man. The rest he parted. Rocks released water. Until he touched the glory. Until he began to, to say, shall we? And God said, you did not glorify me in the midst of those people. So you will not get there anymore. Nobody touches your glory and goes further. Lord, I pray this morning that you will do deep work in our hearts. That as we go on waiting on you today, and as we are watching you bring this meeting progressively on, you will not stop until what you have ordained to do with us today is accomplished. We sense that the allocation for today is dealing with the source of our bluntness. The obstacles to our sharpening. Lord, please go ahead. All through the meeting today, let the conviction build up. Let our commitment also build up. Let our repentance build up. Let our total, total surrender, let it build up. Don't do a superficial work, Lord. Get to the root and the fabric of our souls. 
Please help us. In Jesus' name.